show something from the exhibition? This one. This one. Ilyin, Ilyin, Hiroto and Zibin. <laughs> Everything is very easy. Zibin. So, uh, my name is Valeria Sirota, and I'm presenting our work uh, with uh, Anton Ilyin and Kirill Zibin. Uh, our topic is passive scalar transport, but I'd like to begin with some mathematical, uh, mathemat mathematical preface. It concerns uh, the, mm, so, I'm sorry, how to, to make the next one? Oh, here, here it is. Uh, it concerns the t uh, time exponentials of random uh, matrices, uh, which are the formal solutions to such a linear equation. Uh, the equation is linear, but uh, these are matrices, so they do not commutate, com commutate and uh, uh, the matrix A is assumed to be a given uh, stationary isotropic uh, random process with a given statistics, and uh, the question is how to find the statistics of Q. Uh, here is a good tool for such problems. Well, uh, this equation appears in many uh, turbulent problems, and so I hope that it may be of use not only for passive scalar, but also for, uh, for many other things. Uh, so the important tool is uh, cumulant functions. Here is the mm, definition. Uh, and if there exists a probability density function, uh, then uh, the exponential of the cumulant function is just the Fourier transform of the uh, probability density. In the case that we deal with random processes, uh, we should consider uh, cumulant functionals instead of functions. But if this probe function, uh, the argument of W, changes slowly compared to the characteristic, uh, to the correlation time of the process, A, uh, of, of this process, then uh, uh, the functional can be re just reduced <coughs> to a function in such a way. So anyway, we can deal with cumulant functions. Here is the example, how does this all work? How does this tool work? If we take the one dimensional case, everything is easy. Uh, uh, and we want to calculate, for example, uh, the um, momenta of the value Q. We just have to recall the definition and we immediately get the answer. Uh, by the way, we see that uh, these uh, momenta either grow or decrease exponentially as functions of time. Uh, well, it's okay with one-dimensional case, but what shall we do with multidimensional? Uh, it is uh, convenient to make the so-called Iwasawa decomposition of the matrix Q. Any matrix can be decomposed into a product of uh, an upper triangular matrix, uh, diagonal matrix with positive elements, and rotational matrix. This is true for any matrix, but if Q is the solution to this equation, then these three components behave in a very different way. Namely, as time goes to infinity, uh, the rotational matrix remains just random. Uh, the upper triangular matrix uh, stabilizes at some random limit, at some random value, which depends on the particular realization of the process. Uh, and the diagonal matrix grows, or the ma elements of the diagonal matrix grow or decrease exponentially in this sense, in the sense that there exists such a limit. Uh, moreover, the limit values lambda uh, do not depend on the particular realization of the process. They are the same uh, uh, for uh, all realizations and depend only on the statistics of A. So they are important characteristics of the process, <coughs> of the process, uh, well, of the process A. 
and um, of the process Q. And uh, mm, well, in this sense, they are universal, and they are called Leponov exponents. Uh, in the case of Gaussian uh, field a, uh, of Gaussian process A, uh, their uh, expressions for these Leponov exponents uh, have been calculated, uh, but still there is a question what to do uh, oh. if the process A is not Gaussian. Uh, so uh, since the main part of the Q matrix appears to be the diagonal matrix, so our goal is to know the statistics of the diagonal matrix as a function of the statistics of A. And the good news is that now we know how to do this. Uh, the I main idea is that we have to make a change of variables in such a way that uh, just we just should rotate the A matrix uh, corresponding, correspondingly to the way uh, the Q matrix rotates. So it is not easy to, to just to, to guess why is this uh, mm, change of variables well, good, but it, it still it is good. Uh, and just as the Q matrix is decomposed into a product of three uh, matrices, three components, uh, correspondingly the X matrix can be decomposed into a sum of three components and unlikely the Q matrix, these components are easy to separate from one another, one from another. Uh, and luckily the diagonal part of X uh, corresponds to the diagonal part of the Q matrix. Uh, so, the, so this change of variables is uh, not, is rather complicated because of random matrix R, R still it is possible to calculate the Jacobian of the transformation uh, and so we can eventually calculate the cumulant function of X based on the cumulant function of A. The relation appears to be very simple uh, and uh, since we are interested in the diagonal part of uh, X, uh, we can in some easy way restrict ourselves by the, uh, by, by the diagonal components so we get the cumulant function of the diagonal components. So now knowing the mm, statistics of A, we can uh, calculate any uh, averages of uh, the matrix D. In particular, it is easy to get the expression for the uh, Lyapunov uh, exponent in this case. Well, now we pass on to the plastic scalar transport. Uh, so here is the equation. Uh, theta is the density of passive scalar. V is a random velocity field, and it is assumed to be uh, given. Uh, the Kraken model is, uh, assumes that uh, velocity is delta correlated in time and Gaussian. Uh, and this model is very well studied. There are very many results, but um, uh, its lack is that it is rather far from reality. For example, in this model, uh, there can be no energy cascade because of time reversibility. Uh, well, uh, there is a common mistake to think that if we have a um, sum of a large amount of summons or an integral uh, of a random value, it behaves just like a Gaussian, so we can uh, just replace uh, any integral or sum by a Gaussian value. Uh, it is not so because indeed uh, all the powers of these uh, two uh, random values coincide. But if we take uh, the exponential of uh, this random value, the result would be quite different. So if we take exponentials, then uh, non-Gaussianity is very important. It makes the same contribution, contribution as uh, the first two orders. So what to do if we want to deal with non-Gaussian field? Uh, uh, the usual way is to use the bachelor limit. Uh, this uh, corresponds to the viscous range and then we deal with the uh, velocity stress tensor instead of velocity itself. Uh, the problem was considered by, Bal uh, investigated by Balkovsky and Fuchson and the result was that 
the moments of uh, the scalar density decrease exponentially uh, and the exponents saturate at some large values of alpha. But uh, uh, the relation between the statistics, between these exponents gamma and the statistics of A remained unknown. So in this paper and in this talk, uh, we will find the exact expressions for gamma in terms of statistics of alpha, so given the uh, uh, statistics of A, so given A statistics, we can calculate everything. And uh, the interesting uh, fact is that uh, it appears that the saturation occurs always at the same uh, value of alpha, uh, and it does not depend on the statistics of A at all. The saturation is universal. Uh, well, so uh, we take the bachelor limit and we uh, take the quasi-Lagrangian reference frame. This means that we uh, move along together with one particle. Uh, so the equation becomes like this. Uh, and we'll have to, we'll uh, first solve it and then uh, make the overaging. So, um, to solve, it, it is rather easy because uh, this equation is linear. We have to make a Fourier transform and a change of variables in uh, any order. Uh, and we know that in this change of variables, there are peers, uh, the equation we discussed above. So uh, this is the result in the uh, Fourier space. And to get the, the uh, value in uh, real space, we have to make uh, one more Fourier transform. Uh, for initial condition, we take uh, the isolated blob with Gaussian distribution uh, without any loss of generality. The only important thing is that it has some scale. It is not even important to which scale it has. Um, so uh, now we uh, calculate the value of uh, the passive scalar density, and we see that um, it is... Uh, expressed via the determinant of such a matrix. So we have to uh, calculate such an average. Uh, sometimes people consider homogeneous initial conditions instead of, of an evolution of, uh, instead of the blob evolution. Uh, and uh, it is just the same. You only have to average additionally over the initial conditions. Uh, and the result will be just the same up to renormalization of alpha. So we have to calculate this average. And now we recall that the Q matrix can be decomposed into the three components. Only one of them remains randomly, uh, remains random. Uh, now, if we look at this matrix that we have to, to calculate, we see that Q uh, is here in such a combination and that the rotational matrix uh, vanishes here. So. Uh, the matrix Q is random, but this matrix is not random at large times. Uh, and moreover, to calculate its determinant, we have to take uh, only growing uh, components of the D matrix, because the growing components of the D matrix contribute to the determinant, and the decreasing components do not contribute because of this uh, summon. Well, now, to calculate uh, this determinant is proportional to a product of uh, uh, the components of, of those components of the D matrix that are growing. Well, now, uh, we recall that we know everything about uh, the matrix D or the matrix Z if we know the matrix A. Uh, in, uh, in particular, it is easy to calculate the uh, cumulant function of the Z matrix uh, for any given time. And uh, also, we will need in what follows uh, the probability density. It is also easy to get it by uh, taking the Fourier transform. Now, how to calculate this integral? The most naive uh, way of consideration is, is like this. Uh, well, uh, the Z matrix 
the, the components of Z have some definite limit at large t, at large time. So we just can uh, take these limits instead of these components and we uh, get such a solution. Uh, but of course, this works only for very small values of alpha. Uh, the less naive consideration is like this. Okay, uh, Z are not equal to their limit, but since time is large enough, uh, we hope that at least the sign of z is equal to the sign of its limit. So it's not, not so far from its limit. Then uh, we can also easily calculate the result uh, by uh, using the um, definition of the equivalent function. But it, all it is also not true. It also works only for uh, rather small alphas mm, because... Uh, uh, for any finite, finite time, uh, there exists, uh, for any finite time, uh, uh, there, can, uh, there, exists, uh, there exist particular uh, realizations of the process when uh, the value of z is uh, of the opposite sign to uh, that of lambda, or at least the value of z is zero. Uh, and... Uh, so these uh, particular realizations are very rare, they may be very important, and we will see that it is just what happens. So the uh, honest way to do everything is just to calculate the probability density uh, of Z and then to calculate this integral. Uh, luckily, all these integrals contain a large parameter T in the exponential, so... Uh, uh, so, mm, we can uh, use the saddle point approximation. Now, uh, we uh, find that uh, all the average, all the averages are exponentials and the exponents are the maximums of such functions. Uh, well, and what to do with these functions? Here it is. Uh, this function is not analytical because of this stair-like uh, part and uh, Inside uh, uh, the whole space of, the, uh, yes, well, we uh, have to make averages over all uh, possible values of z or which is the same over all possible values of k. Uh, so if uh, the maximum is reached at the, uh, in the inside the field, the analytical uh, field, uh, the analytical region, then uh, the result is like this. Here is the value of mac the maximal value and uh, but uh, the maximum may as well be reached on the boundary uh, uh, between two analytical uh, regions uh, this boundary corresponds to uh, to the value z sum of the components of z equal to zero and then the maximum looks like this one of the equations is the uh, equation of the mm, determining the boundary. In both cases, uh, the momenta are equal to the exponentials of the, uh, well, in both cases, the exponents are the values of cumulant function at the point where the maximum is achieved. Uh, in the three-dimensional case, everything becomes uh, simpler because of incompressibility. We can make a change of variables in such a way that one vari variable vanishes and everything depends only on two variables. Uh, and also, uh, one of uh, these z components is definitely positive. One of the z components is definitely negative. So only one of them may change its sign. Uh, here are the, some examples uh, to, uh, just to see what this all means. Here is the uh, simplest case, the Gaussian statistics. Uh, in the Gaussian case, the cumulant function of A looks like a paraboloid uh, and the cumulant function of rho looks like a paraboloid shifted to this point. This is the minimum. Uh, and what happens? If we start with alpha equal to zero, we are at this starting point. The maximum is, uh, uh, corresponds to the zero point and we are already situated on the boundary. Uh, this boundary looks like a roof 
So this is the region of analyticity, and this is the region of analyticity, and this is the boundary between these two regions, and the maximum is reached here. As alpha uh, increases, the maximum just moves along this boundary to this point. And as alpha becomes equal to two, the maximum reach, reaches this point, and then it stands there, whatever happens, uh, alpha grow increases, and uh, the maximum stands here, uh, and this is the saturation of the, um, of the uh, exponent. If we take a small deviation from Gaussian, then the boundary uh, does no longer include the zero point. So we start at the point uh, in the inside the region of analyticity. But uh, as alpha increases, we the maximum the point of maximum uh, moves inside this uh, analytical region towards the boundary, and as and as it reaches the boundary, it uh, begins to move along it again. Uh, and again, it goes to this point, and here it st stops. Uh, well, if we consider uh, a reverse uh, sign of the, uh, the a reverse sign of the deviation, uh, the situation is very similar. Uh, we are again in the um, uh, region of analyticity, but now we are moving to the left, just uh, towards the boundary. This boundary is z equal to zero. Yes, this is a boundary between two regions of analyticity. So anyway, whatever we do, we have uh, the point of maximum mean, uh, moves towards the region, uh, the um, boundary, uh, z equal to zero, and then it goes along th this, along this uh, boundary. Uh, well, in, in these two cases, uh, the deviation from Gaussian uh, eventually is very small, but uh, uh, it, is it may be not so if the deviation, I think, uh, if the deviation from Gaussian uh, is large enough, uh, from if the deviation of uh, A process from the Gaussian is large enough. For example, we consider such a <coughs> toy model for the process A, uh, and uh, here we see that in this case, the um, exponents also saturate at uh, alpha equal to, to two, but the shape of the uh, curve is just different. So this is a summary. We analyze the passive scalar advection in a turbulent flow at time much bigger than the correlation time of the flow and scales much smaller than the viscous scale. Um, and we obtain <coughs> exact expressions for the exponents of the Lagrangian scalar density moments in terms of Lagrangian velocity strain tensor statistics. Uh, if velocity is assumed to be delta correlated, the uh, latter coincides with the Euler strain tensor statistics. The exponents saturate at the universal value alpha equal to two, uh, independently of the statistics. In the range between alpha zero and alpha two, uh, they can differ significantly from those in the Gaussian case. Thank you for your attention. Yes. And so yes. did you describe your turbulence well, field as a Gaussian field? Uh, turbulence is a much more complicated problem than just uh, passive scalar transport in a given velocity field. But maybe, <laughs> if we will be successful, <laughs> we, we are just uh, thinking of trying to, uh, to use these techniques to the turbulence. But of course, it is a much more complicated uh, step. So if the hope is that if you get something going here, then you'll be able to extend it to a, uh, a, a turbulent field? To a turbulent field, yeah. Well, uh, here the, uh, the field may be turbulent, but the statistics is assumed to be given. Yes, so we, we do not think of the statistics of velocity. We assume it to be given. And if it is given, then we can calculate the statistics of the passive scalar.